Good morning, good morning. Come on in. Glad to see all of your smiling faces this morning. On this uh, beautiful spring morning, huh? We complain about rain, but we're never in it. You know, road worker. Now, they, that guy can complain about some rain. I just sit in the house, go to my car. It's dry. Was on a motorcycle ride yesterday and got caught in the rain a little bit. I dried out. It's good to see everybody. Um, today, we're going to be looking at God's word. Today, we're going to be worshiping. Um, so think about today, uh, what is it that God wants to teach you? Um, I know that's kind of a generic thing, right? But what about specifics? What in the word is he going to teach you today that you need? What are the things that you've been asking him for specific or, or generally that he wants you to do specifically in your, in your, in your family, in your home life, at work? With your spouse, and what are the things that, that we need to do? You know, it's um, it's easy to focus out there, right? Out there's kind of messed up, but it's not new, right? It's, it was messed up last year, and the year before, and the year before. Your grandparents would tell you, yeah, things out there are kind of messed up, and if you could talk to their grandparents, they'd say the same, right? Um, so it, it's easy to curse the darkness, right? But it's 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 harder to uh, turn on a light and extinguish darkness. So what are the ways in our lives that we could turn on lights? What are the ways that we could uh, turn on a light, certainly in our home, in our neighborhood, in our city, our state? And uh, chances are you can't do anything on the national scale. Um, but we, what can we do in our lives today? And specifically ask God, what can I do as we open your word? And also as we're worshiping him. Let's open in word of prayer. God, we, we thank you thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your kindness and your patience. Father, we, we pray that we could uh, live up to the title of being your ambassadors and, and be good at it. God, I pray that we could represent you in a, in a home that's not really our home because this kingdom is not really our kingdom and we're not full citizens of the earth, God, but, but we have this homesickness for a, for a land that we've never really been. So, God, we, we pray that we could be ambassadors for your kingdom and we could do a good job with it. Father, we pray that your special covering and anointing on this service, that your, your spirit would flow and we could understand it and see it. And we pray that you would um, protect us at home protect us here at church from evil. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. You saw my condition, how I 
had a plan from the start. Your son for redemption, the price for my heart. I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't showed up, there was something this, this morning that gripped my heart, and a reminder that, Lord, you're, you're not just out there, and we're, we're lifting up praise to arrive at you, but that you're here, that you're present with us, that you abide in the praises of your people, that you're walking to and fro down the aisles, Lord, examining hearts. And Lord, may this morning not be a time of just empty worship, repetition of phrases. But Lord, may our hearts cry out to you as a friend who is near, as someone who is here, as a father who loves us. May that worship in our hearts begin to truly rise up, Lord, and may we cry out to you, seeking after our God. Lord, there's healing in you. There's peace in you. There's comfort and there's joy that comes in the morning. Lord, that even though the night might bring terrors, or Father, maybe the week has brought difficulty, this should be the crescendo of our week, being able to come here as the body of Christ to meet with you, to offer up praise and worship to you. Lord, to reexamine our hearts and Lord, lay down the things during the week that maybe wasn't pleasing to you. God, to offer up spiritual worship now is our heart and our desire. And to live, as Mark said, as bright lights amidst a culture of darkness, a world of darkness. Lord, we are the antidote because your spirit dwells within us. And, oh, church, may we lift up our voice to the King who is here. 
think he desires to meet with us. Destined to die and poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned, but suffered as if he did. Word of our testimony, 
Amen. He reigns, doesn't he? So as lights are coming up, um, we're going to take a little while, a few moments to say hi to each other. We, we you know, I, I, I um, hate to tell everybody to come in for the service, almost, because everybody's having a good time getting to know each other, saying hello, catch up, uh, and also kind of the transition time when we're kind of saying hello to each other. Um, it's kind of hard to get the sermon started because everybody's, you know, you hate to break everybody away. But just to remind you, we are having lunch at our place um, uh, after the service. So after a teardown, come on over, ask me the address afterwards, and I'll give it to you when we're not streaming on the internet. And um, yeah, no agenda, and especially today, um, it'll be raining, so we're not going to be going out and doing any evangelism or anything like that. So, uh, so your assignment this morning is to say hello to three people and do that seven times and square it. Okay, begin.
All right. Well, if everybody could, go ahead and grab your seats, and we, we will get going today. I hope you've all had a great morning and that you're prepared for a waterlogged week. It's supposed to, it's supposed to really get some rain. It's supposed to be crazy over the next week. I've heard like six inches. I've heard, well, six inches. <laughs> but that's a lot of rain. Let's hope we don't get quite that much. But uh, hey... I'm sure the land could use it. But all right, let's go ahead and get started today. Uh, let me give you a couple of announcements as you're kind of grabbing your seat and um, blowing on your coffee and everything else. But uh, guys, we still have our Bible study going on. So um, I hope that you can make it to that. We've only got two weeks left in it, though. Um, we're going to be closing up Philippians this coming Wednesday in Philippians 4. And then, of course, the following week, we're going to read through all of the book of uh, Philippians again and just have kind of some closing statements on it. What does it mean for us to live our lives like that? And ladies, there's, of course, the Bible study that's always going on at Leanna's. But uh, I, I want to continue to get this on your radar because coming up a couple of weeks after that, it'll be the third week in June, we're going to be starting a series up here on... Um, I'm not exactly 100% sure on the day, so I, I don't want to say it and get it wrong, but it is going to be that week. It'll probably be Wednesday or Thursday night, but it's going to be a study called The Truth Project, and if you've never gone through that, oh, you should come. I, in listening to some of it, I was reminded just how much of it was very solid and foundational for my understanding on a lot of things biblically. So um, it's going to be a little bit longer than what we normally meet together when we get together. The video is going to be about an hour long, and then we're going to have some time to discuss it afterwards. But this is such a great study. Do not miss it. Um, it will be $10 to um, come into the class, um, and the reason for that is there's a study guide that goes with it as well. So we'll have sign-ups for that probably next week. But what you will see out there that's signed a sign-up right now is Fifth Sunday's coming up. I expected a little more than that. That's a, yes, that's right. So fifth Sunday, the sign up out there is so that we can make sure that we have enough food for everybody. It's a time of extended worship for us as a family, a shorter message, but more worship, and then enjoying a, a fellowship meal together as well. So don't forget to sign up for that. Um, that'll help us out a lot, not having to bring copious amounts of food because you get to help. So let me go ahead and pray for us. And... Um, We'll get started today. Lord, thank you for, the, for such a sweet time of worship this morning. Lord, it was, it was wonderful. I love it when the church of God comes together, Lord, and they reach out to you. And Lord, true worship comes, and Father, you, you manifest yourself in that space, and your, your peace, your love, and your graciousness for us as your people is overwhelming. Lord, and this morning, now that worship has come and it's gone, Father, we desire to get our minds right and to uh, break up any fallow ground that might be in our hearts and receive with meekness the word of God this morning. Lord, we, we want to be a people that desire not just to hear it, not just to build our mental faculties and how much we know, but Lord, to be a people called by your name, not taking your name in vain. But Lord, being intentional with the name that's been spoken over us. 
and to be doers of your word and not just hearers only. So God, this morning, would you give us wisdom in your text today? And Father, would you continue to show yourself strong on behalf of your saints, and uh, especially in difficult days? Lord, for any in our body that is sick this morning, we pray, God, that you might bring healing to their bodies. Lord, if anybody is going through any dark or depressing time, we pray that you may be the lifter of their heads. And Lord, if there's anyone in the house this morning that has been a estranged and walked away from you for a while. Oh God, I pray that you would fan the flames of their hearts and draw them near as you leave the 99 and you go for the one. So Lord, open our ears, open our eyes, and may we be intentional to walk this this morning. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Well, so church, we are uh, continuing through our decidedly determined series, watching Jesus now as he's arrived in Jerusalem in this bit of a testing period that's come upon him. And we're going to see today that some of the questioning of the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the the Sanhedrin are going to continue, and they're going to try to bring Jesus into a trap, um, trapping him in the the things that he's going to say. So again, we're going through that period trying to look at it from the standpoint of Christ himself. God humbles himself, becomes man, and fully lives his life intentionally to the will of the Father. And we know that as Christ followers, when we come to Christ, when we give our lives to him, that we're called to the same, that we're called to surrender ourselves and begin to walk out the will of God in our lives, hopefully with the same sort of determination that we see in Christ. We see throughout the scripture, it says, as he was in the world, so shall we be. That he is the image of the Father, and you and I are called to grow more and more into that image and making sure that our lives are leveraged, not for our own kingdoms, because our kingdom is not of this world, but rather for the kingdom of Christ. And the title of the sermon today is In His Image. And I, I think if there was ever a time when I go through just expository preaching, going line by line through the text, every once in a while... You come upon a section that you're like, I don't really want to teach that. <laughs> Today's that day. <laughs> well, and the reason for that is my, my heart has been so challenged just recently um, as I've been pr- praying, reading the word, drawing near to the Lord of just this desire to, to fan the flames of the heart of the church to absolute obedience to Christ. And then we come upon a, a section of scripture like this and it at first, when you look at it, you're thinking, why did Luke think that this was important to add? Like, like, what does this add to us? How does this help us in any way? And hopefully what we'll see by the end of it is, actually, it's a pretty important topic. It's important for us to understand because we find ourselves in this world, even though we're not of this world. We have to learn how to walk in this world with the different institutions that God has created in the world. So with all that, um, we'll get to that section a little bit later, but uh, we're only going to be in eight verses this morning, verses 19 through 26, and it's going to be about taxes. So fun. But I I assure you, there's a lot in here that um, can both strengthen our faith because of who Christ is, but also challenge us in how we're supposed to be as citizens in the world that we're in, particularly in in the government that we're in. So... With all that being said, let's go ahead and read verses 19 through 26. We'll go through all of it, and then we'll come and break it up into a couple of different places. So, verse 19, the scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who who pretended to be sincere that they may catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly. You show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But... He perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. He said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answer, they became silent. So 
let's, let's remember where we're set right here within Jerusalem and understand why the religious teachers are coming to Jesus and why it is that they seem so upset with him right now. Now remember, Jesus had just fulfilled prophecy in Zechariah and coming down the Mount of Olives on a donkey, presenting himself as king to Israel on the same prophesied date from hundreds of, year pa- hundreds of years past. And now he comes into Jerusalem and they're recognizing him as the king. He comes into the temple. He's flipping tables. He sets up camp in the court of the Gentiles, begins to teach. And what do the Pharisees do? What do the Sanhedrin do? They come to him and they ask him, by what authority are you doing these things? I'm not going to rehash all the stuff that we've talked about leading into that, but what Jesus does do is he begins to give a parable, and it's the parable of the wicked tenants. And we looked back in Isaiah how when Isaiah is giving a song to the nation of Israel, he's given a song based upon Israel being the planted vineyard of the Lord. And of course, in Isaiah's day, he's prophesying that both Assyria and later he prophesies Babylon is going to come in and destroy everything. But what's different about what Jesus does is he's talking about God has sent them tenants or the, the landowner sent them tenants and they send them away. They beat them, they send them away, but then he brings his own son. He sends his son to them in order that he may gather fruit. And of course, they kill him, throw him out of the vineyard. And uh, Jesus, at this point, he says that the stone in which the builders is rejected has become the cornerstone. And, and we looked at that prophecy also from Isaiah, how this is talking about the Jehovah of armies coming and him becoming a stone, a rock of offense, and the nation casting him off, but him becoming a sanctuary. And we see that that's truly happened, that the nation kills Jesus, but yet you and I now are being built up into a sanctuary in Jesus But what we see here right in the beginning is that the scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour. Why were they so upset? Because when you think about the prophecy of Isaiah, when he says that the vineyard that's been given to you, it's gone. In in, in the sense that you're going to be sent to exile, but you're going to come back. God is going to return you back to the land. What is different about what Jesus says? The vineyard is no longer yours. This is it. The time is up. The vineyard is going to be given to someone else. And of course, we know that the Lord becomes that choice vine, and you and I are connected to it. And now as the people of God, we're called to produce good fruit as well. Just as he came to the nation of Israel and inspected their fruit and found them wanting, he comes to you and I to inspect to see if there's fruit in our life. But the major difference is him saying, the vineyard is no longer yours. And that's why they said, surely not. And that's when Jesus looks at him and says that. So this is different in what's coming. And that's the reason why they were so upset. And in their Jewish way, they would love to take him to the top of a cliff, throw him off and stone him. But they can't. And we're going to talk about the reason that they can't today. At least they can't lawfully. So again, that's the reason why they're so upset here. Let's go ahead and read this again. Verse 19. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, and surely he did, and really the whole nation, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who, pre- who pretended to be sincere, so they're playing the hypocrite, that they may catch him in something he said, so as to deliver him up to the authority and the jurisdiction of the governor. So let's just stop right there and work through this just a little bit. Understand what's going on in the nation of Israel right now. Power and authority in the governance of the nation has passed from Judea. It's passed from the Sanhedrin. And that's an important point to understand in what's going on here, particularly since they're going to have to deliver him up over to the Romans to kill him. Now, the governance of the nation, this is actually a pretty big deal in the nation of Israel. And to illustrate it, We're going to go back and we're going to look at a pretty old prophecy this morning. We're going to go look back all the way to Jacob, to the one who was named Israel and his 12 sons. What we see is at the tail end of his life, he begins to give a blessing to his 12 sons. And uh, there's one in particular that we're going to talk about. It's both a blessing and it's a prophecy that's given by Jacob or Israel to his sons. So, This comes from Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. And this verse should come up for you. 
But as he's talking to Judah, he says this, and this is in the NASB version, and the reason I put the NASB version in is because I, I like the way that they say this here. Um, almost all the translations translate this really good. For whatever reason, I don't like the way the ESV does it. Normally, I love the ESV, but um, they're the only ones that translates this verse differently um, to where it's almost not prophetic. It's kind of strange, but let's go ahead and look at it because it was always viewed in Israel as prophetic. It says, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. What is it that Jacob's trying to say to Judah? First of all, he's given kind of firstborn rights to the nation of, of Judah, or sorry, the tribe of Judah, that they're going to rule over their brethren. Now, you would think that it would go to Reuben, who was the firstborn, but there were some pretty shady characters, those first few that were born. Judah was as well, but uh, Judah actually repents later in life, which is probably why the right of the firstborn goes to him here. But notice what he says. He says that the scepter, now the scepter is the ruling. In other words, you're going to be the ruling class, the ruling tribe over the rest of the nation of Israel. So the scepter will not depart from you, nor the ruler's staff, that's basically the lawgiver, the governor's, the, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, that means from his, from his heritage, from the people of Judah, his children and his children and his children. So the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his lineage until Shiloh comes. Now, this has always been looked at as a prophecy of the coming Messiah. So as you look through ancient rabbinical writings, you'll see that they reference the Messiah as Shiloh. So the scepter won't depart until Shiloh comes, until the Messiah comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Now, we see this prophecy really get kicked up at the time of David. Now, David, when he comes upon the scene, David becomes the ruler over the nation of Israel. He becomes their king, and of course, he's from the tribe of Judah. And from him all the way, from David all the way to Zedekiah, as we go through the different kings, particularly of the southern kingdom where Jerusalem is, we see that it's always of the line of the tribe of Judah. What happens after Zedekiah? The Babylonians come in and they lay waste to Jerusalem. And what happens? A lot of the people get carried away into a foreign land. Now remember, the scepter is not supposed to depart until Shiloh comes. Well, when they go off into exile, it's pretty interesting when you look at the history behind it. They actually get to continue to still govern themselves in some ways. So the scepter doesn't really depart from the nation. And we see that in Ezra chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. Ezra is part of the, the period of those that are returning. And it says this, Then rose up the heads of the father's houses of Judah and Benjamin. So notice this, that by the time they've been this long in captivity already, they still have tribal distinction. There's still the tribe of Judah. There's still the tribe of Benjamin. So then rose up the heads of the father's houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that's in Jerusalem. Again, the Babylonians had destroyed it. And then verse 8, it says, Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out in the charge of Mithridath, the treasurer, and counted them out to Sheshbazar, who was who? Sheshbazar was the prince of Judah. So there's still somebody in Judah, the tribe of Judah, that is considered to be the prince. So even though Israel gets carried away, there's still some sort of governance that they have even when they're in Babylonian captivity. Now, when they return, they return under a guy named Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel's actually of the tribe of Judah as well. Leadership passes from him, and it passes to Meshulam, and then to Hananiah. And these guys are all of the tribe of Judah. Now, things get a little bit tough to understand that happens right after this, because the, Greek, the Greeks end up coming in. Alexander the Great comes in at 332 B.C., and he conquers the area of Palestine at this time. But what's interesting also, the more you read, you find out that he still allowed them governance over themselves. The high priest still did a lot of work. They still followed the Torah through that. And 
there's, there's more people that come in, the Ptolemics and also the Seleucids. And then from there, it goes to the Hasmonean dynasty. So we see this transfer of power shifting, but it really transfers back during that Hasmonean dynasty. And I know this is a lot of history this morning. I'm trying to make it as succinct as possible. But that's from the rise of the, the Maccabees and the revolt of the Maccabees. But, the, but what you need to know through all that is Israel maintained their right to rule over their own people. Now, once the Hasmonean dynasty passes, all of a sudden the Herodian dynasty comes, and that's the one that should at least perk your ears a little bit because we hear a lot about Herod as we read through the Gospels. So there's actually a, um, a map that I want to put up real quick just to give you an idea of how the nation got separated during the time of Herod. And you've seen this before. But when Herod the Great dies, and by the way, Herod still had some sort of ruling authority and the, the ability to be able to put to death Israelites. How do we know that? The slaughter of the innocents. Remember, sometime between 4 to 6 BC, uh, Herod the Great ordered the killing of all the, the young boys in Israel because he had heard that the Messiah had been born. So he still has the right towards capital punishment. But after he dies, the kingdom, he dies in 4 BC, by the way, and the kingdom gets split up between his sons. That yellow region up at the top was by Herod Philip. The green area where Jesus has done most of his ministry is Herod Antipas. And of course, he's going to come up in the trial of Jesus. Pontius Pilate's going to send him to Herod. Why? Because that's where Jesus did the majority of his ministry. That's where he was from. But then that red area was given to a guy named Herod Archelaus. Now, Herod Archelaus, he was not accepted by the people of Judea. And he had a little bit of Jewish blood in him, so it's not as though um, the scepter had departed. But we, what we see happen here, and this is important to understand, is that because the people of Judea don't accept Herod Archelaus, Rome does what Rome does. They get rid of Herod Archelaus, and they put their own governor, their own pro procurator, over it. So that red region actually moves from being Jewish to now being Roman, and a guy named Caponius becomes the governor of it. Now, this is when everything changes. If you read in the Talmud, it says at that time that the people were going through Israel and they were putting sackcloth on and they were putting ash in their hair and they were crying out, woe is us for the scepter has departed from Judah and the Messiah didn't come. That would have happened around 6 to 7 AD. Little did they know there was a young Jewish boy that was about 12 years old that was presenting himself at the temple that was the Messiah. The scepter departed from Ju Judah, and Messiah did come. It's a powerful prophecy, and we continue to see just the, the power and the precision of prophecy. The more and more we study the Bible, that God truly is outside of time. He knows everything, and His will is going to come to pass. But when we look at the nation of Israel, this is why in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, you see that, it's in the, that Caesar Augustus made a decree in the days of Quirinius that a census might be taken. Why? So that they could get account of the people for the purposes of taxation. And this is why it's such a hot-button topic in Israel. And this is why the Pharisees are, and the Sadducees and the chief priests are going to do what they're about to do. But it's important for you to know the, the kind of the climate that's around the Temple Mount at this time. And there's all this fervor that's taken place because the people are becoming more and more and more pro-Jesus. Less and less and less are they given any kind of uh, obedience to the Pharisees. They're becoming more and more anti-Pharisee. Now, when we look at this, it says in the beginning here that it was the scribes and the chief priests that sought to lay hands on him. When Matthew talks about it, this section to us in Matthew 22, he actually talks about one other group of people that's there as well. It's called the Herodians. Now, the Herodians are a different kind of group. So at the temple right now, what do we have? We have Jesus and his disciples that have come into town, a lot of messianic fervor that's there. The people of Israel that had come in order to sacrifice for the Passover, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
you have the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, this ruling class known as the Sanhedrin, but we also have one other group of people here called the Herodians. Now, the Herodians are people that are loyalists to Herod. They're pure politicians. They see that Herod is the king, so therefore, they're going to give obedience to Herod. Now, you want to know who hates the Herodians? The Pharisees. But what's interesting here is that the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, they come together with the Herodians, and they try to make a plan together. Why? Because one thing that people can always agree on is how to keep power. And the enemy of your enemy is your friend. They saw Jesus as the enemy. And this actually isn't the first time that they try to collaborate together. We see it early on in the ministry of Jesus as well. I think it's in Mark 3 where Jesus goes inside of a synagogue and there's a guy with a withered hand. And uh, they're sitting there and they're watching him trying to find out, is he going to heal on the Sabbath? And Jesus gets frustrated with them and he says, is it lawful to do good or to do evil on the Sabbath? They don't answer. He gets angry at their hardness of heart. He heals the man. And then it says this, that from that point on, the Pharisees and the Herodians sought a way to kill him. So from the beginning of Jesus' ministry until now, he's made enemies both with the, um, with the Herodians and with the, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. These guys did not like him. So now we see these guys come together, and we're going to really see the genius of the plot that they end up bringing to Jesus, the question that they have, and it's really tricky. So let's look again. So they, they thought that they might catch him in something that he said, so as to deliver him up to the authority and the jurisdiction of the governor. What's happened in Israel? The scepter has departed. Herod the Great was able to slaughter the innocents. These guys can't kill anybody. So they're going to have to figure out a way to deliver Jesus to the Romans so that the Romans will do it, because that's the legal way to do it. Verse 21, so they asked him, here's the question, this grand scheme, this planning, this plotting by these guys come together. So they ask him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. L listen to the way that they're pumping up Jesus and saying, we know you always follow the Torah. And for everybody here that's becoming pro-Jesus, he always follows the Torah. So what's the question? Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? They've trapped Jesus, so they think. Why? Because if Jesus answers, no, according to the law, governance is Israel's. It's yours. It is not lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar. And then the people will love that, but what will happen? The Herodians are going to run and they're going to report it. And now all of a sudden, Jesus is going to be seen as an insurrectionist and Rome is going to have to do something about it. Now, Rome, they, they tried to practice peace for the most part, something called the Pax Romana, but uh, the one thing that they dealt with furiously was the rise of an insurrectionist. So this is what they're trying to get Jesus to step into that trap. Now, if he goes the other way and he becomes sympathetic with Rome, what are all the people that think he's the Messiah and he's going to overthrow Rome going to do? They're not going to believe him in, in, in him anymore. So this is a perfect plan, seemingly, that they end up giving. And that's the difficulty of it. I mean, it's, it's a malevolent genius that they give. So let's see what Jesus does. Verse 23, but he perceived their craftiness in his Jesus way. <laughs> but he perceived their craftiness and said to them, show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. He said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answer, they became silent. What does Jesus do? He provides a dichotomy. And he says, there's things of this world in order that we must do those things of the world, but there are things of God and you must do the things of God. And the people are stupefied, <laughs> dumbfounded, like, that's a good answer. What does this mean for us? We see that Jesus, omniscient and all wise, is able to answer this, but what does that mean for us? What, what is it that we can pull out of this? Because we are not the nation of Israel, Right? We're not. God hasn't created 
a, a, a nation called Christiana, Christianity Delphia to where we come and where we all rule over one another and we can elect godly rules and have a king over us. We're not Israel. Israel was its own distinct thing. You and I are of a different vine. We're a vine of Christ that has reached through every single government of the world to every tribe, nation, people, and tongue to pull out disciples for the king. So how do we handle this? How, how do we look at our own lives? Because you and I, we have to walk in this world. We are in the United States of America. There is government that's over us. If Jesus separates these two, how do we walk? So I wanted to spend a little bit of time this morning talking about something called sphere sovereignty. That's a really fancy word, right? <laughs> fancy phrase. But sphere sovereignty is the idea that God has created diff different social institutions. And you could press me and we could talk about a, a number of them, but there's three main social institutions that God has created, the family, the church, and government. So we're going to try to understand those today, how those fit together and how you and I are called to walk in each one of those. And actually, the first time that I ever heard about this was in something called the Truth Project. So... Um, it's, it's funny that we're talking about it today as we're promoting that we're going to go through this, but they actually go through it a little bit more robust than what we're going to today, and they're going to add some different spheres to it. But the first one we're going to look at is something that God created called the family. Now remember, because God has created these social institutions, that means he has also created order by which they must be ruled and how we submit now, before we talk about that, because submitting seems to be an ugly word in our society today, I want to remind you that there is even order within the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, all co-equal, but the Son submits to the Father. The Spirit is sent forth from the Son. So there's different roles even within the Godhead. There's order that's there, and God has stamped order within these social spheres as well. And it's important for us to understand that order. Why? Because God is over everything and we are called to submit ourselves to him. So what is he saying to us? How is God asking us to walk in these different social spheres? So let's take a look at the family first. And this is the order that God gives us for the family. So biblically, the husband is supposed to be the head of the home. Now, that sounds like it's like, oh, for the ladies, oh, lucky, y'all get to lead. Not so. The reason why it's challenging is because as husbands, we're going to have to give an account to the Lord of our families. So the authority has been given to the father to lead, but also when God comes to look at the fruit of the family, it's going to be on us, dads. So have we led well? Have we submitted ourselves to our head, which is Christ? And are we ruling well in our homes? Are we leading well? So the husband is the head. The wife submits unto the husband. And hopefully, like there is in our house, there's good conversation between you and your wife, husbands, and you guys come to most conclusions together. That's how it's always been in our home. Cindy and I talk through things, and we determine what we think is the best course of action. But there's been a few times in our marriage maybe a couple of handfuls of time, in which Cindy and I come to completely different ideas about how something needs to be handled. And I'm, I'm thankful for my wife. In those areas, she's always said, you're the leader, you have to give an account for it, so <laughs> we'll do your thing. And I love that. And sometimes I've been wrong, sometimes I've been right in those. But this is the way that the family is set up. The wife submits to the, to the um, husband, and then the children are called to a place of obedience. Think about the Godhead. The Son submits to the Father, and the Spirit is sent forth from the Son. But you and I, we have been welcomed into the sphere of the Godhead, which is crazy. We've been welcomed into a relationship with Christ as His sons now. For what purpose? For obedience to the Father, in the same way that our children are called to be obedient to us. So that's the family. Let's talk about... Oh, actually, also... Let's talk about the level of punishment, because each one of these spheres, because they've been set in order, 
There's some different things that we need to talk about in them as well. What is the highest level of authority or punishment that's given to the father in the family? Spanking them kids, y'all. <laughs> now, we're, we aren't given the authority by God to kill our kids or to abuse our kids for that matter, but we are called in order to bring punishment when punishment is necessary and to do it in a good and a godly way. So that's the highest level of punishments that's there. What about the jurisdiction within this sphere? Well, I have jurisdiction to lead my family. I don't have jurisdiction to lead your family. Now, there are going to be some places where these kind of overlap a little bit, and we'll talk a little bit about those, but I did want you to understand the level of punishment and the jurisdiction. You're called to lead your family, not Joe's family. <laughs> Joe family. Lead Joe family. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, so let's look at the second one. The church. Now, with the church, what we see is that Jesus is the head of the church. And Jesus has also established order within the church. And that's where we get the idea of elders and pastors. That the elders and pastors that are over a church, they're called to lead. They're called to be the ones that make decisions on certain areas. And then the congregation are called to submit to the leaders. It's my favorite part. We're called, you guys are called to give double honor to those who lead over you in the word. This is the way order in the church is supposed to take place. The elders are called to lead. They submit unto God. And not only that, just like in the family, fathers, how you will have to give an account to God for your family, in the same way, the elders of the church have to give an account for you. So imagine that. You just have to give an account for your family. I get to give an account, Mark gives to give an account, or anybody else that becomes a pastor, elder here, of the congregation. That's frightening. Because we'll be held to a strict standard in that day. But this is, these are two now different social institutions that God has created. The family and the church. Let's talk about the last one that we're going to go through today called government. Now, the government that God has created... So there is a high figure, an authority figure over all of it. We call him the president. Other people may call him the king or whatever, or Roman senate or whatever. And they are there in order to enact the laws, to create laws, and hopefully God-honoring laws. And then they're supposed to make sure that they punish those who break those laws and also do good for those who obey the laws. They're to judge. They're to protect. These are the different callings that God has given for our government, particularly in the United States of America. And we the people, what are we called to do? Same thing. We're called to submit to our leaders, and we're called to pray for our leaders as well. So we see these three different social spheres, and what we need to understand is that as citizens of heaven, you and I, that our ultimate allegiance is to God. But God has called us to be in this world, and we have to understand these different institutions to understand what God's will is for us in those institutions, how we're supposed to relate to them, and to be good citizens, to be good fathers, to be good mothers, to be good sons and daughters within them, to understand what is pleasing in the sight of God in these different spheres. Now, there are times of overlap, just like I said, like, for example, the government might impose a tax. That tax affects my family. It may affect uh, how we spend money. It may affect how we give to the church. It may affect a few things, but there's overlap within them. And think about the family. If all of a sudden the, the husband rises up and begins to abuse his family, then the state steps in. So there are times of overlap that are there. The elder of the church may make advice to the father to help him lead in his sphere known as the family. You guys may come and seek godly wisdom in some areas, and that's kind of a time of overlap. So these things all fit together in some ways, but the main thing that I want us to think about this morning is how do we honor God in those three spheres? So... When it comes to government, which is the big one, because we kind of understand family and church, but we have a tendency to want to um, really hate our government and uh, speak about it a lot, maybe Facebook about it a lot or, or whatever. 
So what are we called to do? Let's look at 1 Peter 2, verse 13 through 17. So Peter says this, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Verse 15 is really important. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. And then verse 17, it says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Did you catch that? Honor everyone, including the emperor. Okay, let's look at how Paul says it in Romans 13. Now remember, most of the people that they're talking to, they have been in the nation of Israel. They've understood governance within Israel, and now all of a sudden there is no Israel. There is no Sanhedrin. How do we relate to the government? How do we relate to the different places that God sends us? This is how Paul says it in Romans 13. We'll look at verse 1 and 2 and also 5 through 7. He says the same thing. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. And here is a key that we need to understand. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist, who's instituted them? God. Now we get, it's really neat that in America we have the opportunity to vote. An opportunity to have a say and who our elected officials, our leaders are going to be. But who has the ultimate say? God. This all falls under the umbrella of God's sovereignty. So our current president, the one before him, the ones before him, these are under the sovereign hand of God. So he goes on and he says, verse 2, Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. Judgment from who? <laughs> well, both. Both the state and even by God. And he actually says that. Look at verse 5. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Are we supposed to pay taxes? That one hurts to say yeah to, right? <laughs> so, verse 7. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Now, you might be thinking, but Trent, I really don't like the guy that's in office. Or maybe you love the guy that's in office. I don't know. Do we really need to obey? Do we really need to do the things that the government is imposing on us? I want to remind you who was emperor when Peter and Paul probably wrote this. It might have been at the tail end of Claudius' reign, but more than likely it was Nero. Nero was tarring Christians, setting them on fire while they were still alive to be used as torches for his parties. This is not a good man. Burns down part of the Roman Empire. Who does he blame it on? What does Peter and Paul say about that guy? Be subject to him. He's been put there by God. That's a hard pill to swallow. It's hard to think that God will raise up governments of the world and he will raise up people groups that seem diabolical. Now, God doesn't institute every single law that wicked people institute, so we, we can't look at it in, in regards to every law that's created comes from God as well. This comes from the hearts of wicked men, but God has put them in place and in authority. And you and I are called to honor them. I don't know if we really look like we do that right now. I want to challenge us in that. Is that to say that we're not to challenge wicked things or not to challenge abortion or not to challenge things like that? No, we, we need to. We have a voice in our country, but we do need to honor the President of the United States. 
as hard as that may be for you guys to hear. Let's look at one last set of verses, 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 through 4, at least the last set that relates to this. We've got tons more. Don't worry. 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 through 4. This is what Paul says to Timothy. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, not just some people, not just Christians, all people. Why? For kings and for all who are in high positions. So all people includes all kings, all people in high positions. Why? That we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Verse 3, this is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires what? Desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Who's the all people? It's all people. Kings, all of them. God has a desire that we may walk in such a way that maybe it reflects his glory and his goodness, that we should be praying for the leaders that are over us, that maybe they would give their lives to the king of kings, that they would institute godly rules, that we may live our lives in a peace of, peaceable and godly way. This is pleasing to the sight of God. Now, no matter what side of the aisle that we stand on, we honor the emperor, or in our case, the president, and we pray for him. That's the call, and I'll, I'll ask you, how, how much have you prayed for our current president, if you're being honest with yourself? How much have you spoken ill of him and compared to how much you've prayed for him? I probably fail that test. <laughs> But the scripture should bear its weight on us this morning and understand what is pleasing in the sight of God and how he would have, have us act. Now, because we put these things in different spheres, there's autonomy in these different spheres. And that's the last thing that I want to talk about today that we need to understand. What happens when all of a sudden the state and its circle begins to enlarge and it begins to come over the authority that the father has in the family or the authority that the church is supposed to have as a separate and distinct social institution, that is when the state has gone awry and we are called to rebel. We see that in uh, Acts in the beginning, Acts chapter 5, for example, when they charged the disciples, do not speak in the name of Jesus Christ. And he said, it's better for us to obey God rather than men. So that's the last piece of the puzzle for us. There are going to come times when the state, because the state has the natural tendency to try to become the ruler of everything and try to become God and get their hands in everything. When it all of a sudden begins to make authority claims over my family that are ungodly or authority claims over education or whatever the case may be, authority claims over the church that you shall not preach anymore or no longer can you go out and share the gospel in the park or knock on people's doors, what do we do? We rebel because the government just stepped into a sphere that they had no authority in. We have been given authority by God in this area. Now, what scares me is what we, where we find ourselves right now is in a place of peace. We're in this strange anomaly in history where... The government's not coming against the church. Maybe we're starting to see that change, and we're, it's certainly happening all over the world. Maybe not so much here, but it, it seems to be something is going on there. What do we do? What do we do when that happens? The, the scary part is that in this time of peace that we've had, so few people are even intentional to go out and share their faith in a time of peace. What happens when all of a sudden the government goes awry or a different nation comes in and bans it? Do we, do we rise up then against the face of potential death when, when we wouldn't do it just because we might be ridiculed? That's a large leap to take. But we know the call of God. We know what he's asked of us. To seek out a people for his name and to disciple those people. 
And some of you have, may have more of an inclination towards evangelism. Some of you may have more of an inclination towards discipleship. And we work together like Paul and Apollos. But this is the call of the church. This is what we're called to do. And we're in a time of peace right now. And that peace may come to an end soon. I don't know. But if it does, I pray that the church has a backbone. And I pray that we still continue to do what God has called us to do. Now, let's, let's finish up this little section here. Well, you know what? Let me say one more thing and read a whole lot of verses real quick. Is there ever a time that God raises up a wicked country for his purpose? Crickets, man. Yes, so there is. I want to read to you a couple of those examples just to get in your mind and think about. The first one's Isaiah 45, verse 1 through 4. We've already talked about Cyrus a little bit earlier in Ezra, but listen to what Isaiah says here, or really what God says. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and loose the belts of kings. Cyrus is a pagan king. He's not an Israeli king. He's a pagan king. He's wicked. God has grabbed him by the right hand to subdue nations before him, to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you, says God, and level the exalted places. I'll break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes and secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by name. I name you, though you do not know me. Pagan king. Let's look at Daniel. Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar has just come in and wasted Jerusalem and carried off captives of war, killed a lot of Jewish people. Now, it's in this context that all of a sudden Nebuchadnezzar is on his roof and he's marveling about what a bad dude he is. Like, I've, look at what I've done with my mighty hand. Listen to what happens in Daniel 4, verse 29. At the end of 12 months, he, being Nebuchadnezzar, was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power, as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty? I love verse 31. While the words were still in the king's mouth, There fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men. And this is when he goes and begins to eat grass and becomes like an animal. But then it says this at the end, it says, and you shall be driven from among men until you know that the Most High rules who? The kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Even wicked King Nebuchadnezzar, under the authority of God, God has raised him up for a purpose, and that purpose was even to punish Israel. This is the God that we talk about. This is the God that we sit in here and sing songs to. The God that throttles the kingdoms of the world, who counts them as nothing, who burns them with ash, to ash. This is the God we come to and we worship. And so when Jesus says this and he says, whose likeness, whose image is on the denarius? Caesar's. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. What's the implication here? Whose image is imprinted on you? God's. What are you to give to God? You. Everything in every sphere of life, full surrender to the King of Kings. He owns us. It says that we are no longer our own. We've been bought with a price. So therefore, honor God in our bodies. He has purchased us through the redemption of his son, the costly blood of Christ shed on our behalf that we may become his. And his we are. Stamped and imprinted with the image of God. My hope Actually, when we think about those spheres and we think about fathers that we're going to have to give an account of our families, I think a lot about having to give an account for everyone that's here. Think about that. I will stand before Christ and give an account of you. I, I pray 
that I have not been too afraid to tell you the truth, to challenge you, to rebuke when sin arises. God is calling for himself a holy people that are completely submitted to him. That's why when he's going through the regions of Galilee or he's going through Judea, he continues to say, unless you surrender all, you can't come. You cannot be my disciple. If you want my image imprinted on you, and of course every human has that imprint, so they'll all give an account. But for us in which the Spirit of God has come and the seal of God has come, and we're growing more and more into that image, we are accountable for what God has called us to be, what He's called us to do. So I'm always, I pray, I'm always going to stand up here and be kind of hard with the Word and tell us, we better wake up. We better wake up to what God is calling us to do and not continue to give our lives to other things. It's so easy in American Christianity to come and just give Sundays to Christ. This this should be the crescendo of our week where we come together when we're teaching one another. We're talking about Christ. We're talking about the amazing things he did during the week and corporately gather into worship and to meet with him in communion. And then... All of this encouragement and edification that we receive here is for the purpose of going out to every tribe, nation, people, and tongue, living as people of God in a crooked and wicked generation, shining as bright lights before them. How we talk about our president, how we live our lives, how we are in the workplace, the kindness and the meekness that we show to the person behind the counter at the convenience store? Does our life show that God has sovereignty over us? His image is on us and we are his. That's why he tells us in the Ten Commandments, don't take this lightly. Don't take my name in vain. Don't take it in just a haphazard way. You are representing me to the nations. For whatever reason, this sovereign God who will eventually turn everything to ash. For whatever reason, this sovereign God in this pocket of time that we live in, from creation until the moment that it's done, has allowed mankind the opportunity to either give obedience to him, to surrender to him, to make him king and lord, to where he has full sovereignty and authority to every rule, every command, everything he's called to, He's, for whatever reason, given us opportunity in this time to either accept that or not. But there's coming a time when every knee will bow. Eventually, we all bow our knee. Let's pray that we bow it now. That we understand the call of King Christ. That he has authority. He has sovereignty over every sphere. I want to close reading... Psalm chapter 2. I'm going to read the whole psalm to you. Think about it in context of what's going on here with the, te- the question of taxation and what we talked about. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that's Christ, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. We don't want the sovereign God to rule over us, to lead us. We want to do our own thing. We want to become God is essentially what's happening. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. What is God's response to the nations raging and plotting against him? He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I've begotten you. That's speaking of the resurrection when all authority is given to Christ. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me. And I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. What happens after the resurrection? All authority has been on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, here's your marching orders. Go. 
Go get them. Go tell them of my love. Go tell them of my availability through Christ that they may be saved. Because if they don't, verse 9, you shall break them with a rod of iron. Here's the, here's the highest level of discipline in the sphere of God. Death to all mankind. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And what's his jurisdiction? Everything. Everything. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoicing and, and trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. What a, what a difference. What a contrast between cursed, dashed, destroyed, wrath, blessed. Our God is a strong and mighty tower. He has provided a way for mankind to be saved, to be reconciled from the wrath to come. But the call is steep. His life for your life. He'll take on your sin on the cross while you take on his righteousness. And we get to enter into a relationship with this God who is sovereign, holy, powerful, and altogether lovely. The greatest thing you will ever find in this life is peace with God, relationship with God, because you have been designed to live in harmony with them. And the only time our life finds fullness and completion and the joy that you've been so desperately looking for is in him. And he is a refuge and a strong tower for those who would run to him. Because the other day, it is coming. For whatever reason, he's given time right now that we may either choose him or choose the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and walk away from him. If you've never given your life to Christ and surrender to him, make today that day. Don't hasten, or hasten, come. Don't delay. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you that you have presented yourself to mankind as a God who loves us, who has made a way, who has opened up through the veil of his flesh a path to the Father that we may be reconciled to a living and beautiful and wonderfully pleasant God. Oh, Father, you're, we also know that your fury and your anger burns for those, the nations and the individuals who, who would choose not to follow you. But Lord, may we come to you this morning and may we kiss the Son and deliver our lives without any reservation to you. And may we be a church that rises up hungry and zealous for good works, to do your will, whether it's in the realm of government, family, church, at work. May we remember that we are stamped with a different image than Caesar. We are stamped with your image. And you are calling us as your church to produce godly fruit to you. Father, if there is anyone in here this morning that has never surrendered their life to you, they've been on the fence, they've believed, but they haven't followed, I pray, Spirit of God, that you would grip the hearts of the people. And Lord, that today would be the day of salvation, of letting go of those things that we hold on to that produce death, to let go of them, that true peace may come. Oh, Lord, to continue to fight is a terrible thing. But to lay down our arms and come to you is the most joyful and peaceful and wonderful thing. If there's anyone here this morning that wants to give their life to Christ, I pray that you would simply talk to the Father now. That you would say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I've never surrendered my life to you. But I've heard the gospel today 
that you've died for my sins and rose again and you've called me to walk with you. I surrender unto you, Lord. I repent of my sin. Please fill me with your spirit. Seal me with the Holy Spirit and save me, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that anybody here this morning that may have prayed that and reached out to you, that, Lord, you'd fill them with power and strength to walk amongst these social institutions the way you've called us to, to offer up godly sacrifices to you, and, oh, God, that you would fill their hearts with incredible peace and that they would serve you all the days of your life, being hungry and zealous to find a way to honor you. With every eye closed, if there's anyone here this morning that wants to give your life to Christ that never has before, I just ask that you simply raise your hand and say, Trent, that was me this morning. I felt the Father calling me, and I desire to come to him. If there's anybody online that has given their life to Christ, I pray you reach out to us so we can talk about next steps and following the Lord's command and baptism and being his people. Lord, we... We as your church now turn our focus to communion. Lord, we do believe that this is the absolute zenith point of our service, that we get to have communion and fellowship with you now in a special way. So if the ushers would, go ahead and start passing out the elements. And Mark, if you want to come lead this. So Jesus said to um, do this in remembrance of him as often as we do it. So the Lord's Supper or communion or Eucharist, whatever you want to call it, it's a time where we specifically remember the death of Jesus on the cross. Because his body was, was broken for us. And his blood was spilled out for us. And it's strange that he chose something so common. This was bread and the cup. So if you're new, um, these are double stacked. So examine your heart now for a moment, or allow God to do it. Just ask him to do it. He'll do it. The Holy Spirit's pretty good at pointing out sins that we need to confess. So I'd ask you to just do that. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till next week. said, uh, this is my body which is broken for you. Jesus said, for this is my blood which is poured out for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this mystery, this union that we have in you. Now the infinite decides to indwell us in a way that we just can't quite understand. We don't have to understand it. We just have to accept it. We have to know that when we follow you, that the Holy Spirit is within us. You can divide infinity by two. You can divide infinity by a hundred. You can divide infinity by two billion. 
You still got infinity. So, Heavenly Father, we pray that we could be your ambassadors this week. God, we pray that um, we could shine the light in the darkness. And may the love of the Father and the grace of Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. I just want to say one last thing as, as you go to leave. Obviously, we have tear down today, but don't forget that sign up for Fifth Sunday is going on right now. So we'd love for you guys to sign up. All of us bring a dish together and really have a, an awesome love feast together. So 